Good morning. Welcome to Church in the Mall. Welcome home. We are in the midst of a sermon series on the book of Acts. We are now in chapter 6 and 7. Today we're going to primarily focus on chapter 6 and then we'll pick up chapter 7 during our Monday and Wednesday time together. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and flip open. Let's begin in chapter 6. It says, in those days, the number of disciples was increasing. That means more and more people were hearing this good news, this message that Jesus is, in fact, the King and the Messiah and Savior. And so as they are understanding this, these Jews are coming to faith in Christ. But now something interesting happens. It says, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So... You have a Hellenistic group, which tends to be the Greek Jews. These are people that came to faith uh, outside of Jerusalem, and they come from a different culture, a different background. Uh, their dialects may be a little different, how they dress, uh, their values, and the things that they find important to them would be different. But as they come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, being recent converts to Judaism, they've now converted into Christianity, and they have joined this early church of Jews who have accepted Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. Now, there's a problem that's going to happen here. They're being overlooked for their daily distribution of food. So these widows, which normally operated on the systems that were put in place by the Jews in the city of Jerusalem, well, now that they're converts to Christianity, those systems seem to no longer apply or to meet their needs. In other words, they're being shunned by their fellow Jews. Now, Many people from outside of Jerusalem that came to become Hebrew followers of Yahweh would often in their later years come to Jerusalem in hopes that they would live out their days and die there and be buried with their ancestors. That was really important to them. So Jerusalem clearly had a, an ongoing situation where people were coming, usually of elder age. And so these systems that were in place uh, were more than adequate, except when people became Christians. You see, now no longer are they considered Jews and therefore they're now being shunned in their communities. So this early church group, which represents what the temple should have been from the very beginning, selling all they have and providing for all those so that there's nobody in need, um, so that they can become the kingdom and the experience of God here on earth. They take these people in and they begin coming up with options of what they can do to solve this key problem. In verse 2, So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, I, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Now, that's a funny word, wait on tables. It, it means to exchange money like the people at the money tables would do in the temple where they would exchange money for offerings or gifts or, or things that people would want to take into the temple. They say, look, we don't want any part of that. What we need are people to handle that, other people to minister in that way in the church. We want to devote ourselves to the teaching of the word of God. I don't think much has changed in this world in the sense that often pastors are, are pulled off of where they need to be with God because they're so focused on doing all the little ministry pieces in the church. When what we really need are people in the church to step up into this area of leadership. And so here at Church in the Mall, this has always been a value of ours. In fact, we only have two paid staff members. And the reason for that is because we want to allow people the opportunity to serve God in multiple ways. And so you'll see that recognized in our community. But let's continue the story because I think there's a lot in here that actually pertains to who we are today as Christians in our own walk with God. So, brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and then give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal, this please, the whole group, and together as a church group, they selected seven people. Stephen, a man full of faith by the Holy Spirit, Philip, Procurius, Nicoron, Tim Timon, Paramines, and Nicholas from Antioch. Now, what's fascinating to me is these are all Greek names, 
There seems to be a Greek and a Jewish problem going on in the church, but the reality is most Jews had three names. They had their Hebrew name or Jewish name. They had a Greek name as they dealt with the Greeks, and then they also had a Roman name as they dealt with the Romans. And so this is very typical, but the two in particular that stick out to me are Stephen and Nicholas. As we'll read on, they truly were converts into the faith. And so these are truly Greeks that are a part of this. And so in order to solve the problem, they don't just pick people from among the Jewish tradition and background, but they pick people from this new Grecian background, uh, recent converts to Judaism that have now converted to Christianity as well as Jews that have converted to Christianity to work together. And there's a reason for this. You see, it could have been so much easier for them to say, hey, you know what, not our problem. Go ahead and divide out and form your own church community. You can be the church of the Greeks and we'll be the church of the Jews. But the problem is they would have missed out on what God would teach and do through each one of them in each other's lives. So today in the church, we simply ask this question, would we also miss out on what God wants to do in our lives if we were to reject people of color, people of race, people of ethnicity, people with different sexual lifestyles, uh, people who prefer different things, or perhaps people that have different political views? Would we reject people of different social and economic values? Would we tell them all to form their own churches or would we work hard together to unify the church under one Christ, our Lord and our Savior Jesus, so that together we can grow and learn what the kingdom of God will actually be like when we go there one day? Let's continue the story. So the word of God begins to spread as these people take their positions in the church and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests, that's the Jewish leaders of the community, became obedient to the faith. In other words, they came to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now, again, I want to emphasize this idea. What happens if we reject people who are different from us? And we tell them, hey, that's good that you know Jesus, but go ahead and, and, and do your thing with Jesus somewhere else. Don't do it here. Boy, we would miss out on such a rich opportunity to see how deep the kingdom of God really is. To one day stand in heaven amongst all the diversity that have called Jesus their Lord and their Savior. We would miss out and we would lose an opportunity in which we might grow ourselves. Now, if you're like me, which I'm assuming you are, you've probably found yourself in situations where you don't want to talk about those difficult topics. You don't want to share those things, uh, even your personal beliefs and views on certain topics, unless you're with your own kind. That means people who agree with you, because that's a lot safer. But what happens is those conversations that happen where we all side together in our little tribes or our groups, end up dividing us against others that might be a part of the greater community of the church. So here at Church in the Mall from day one, we always began by saying, what are the things we value most? And we came up with two things we value above all else. One, we value God and the relationship people have with him and the story that begins with God in their lives. And two, we value people because they matter to God. No matter what color, no matter what gender, no matter what sexuality, no matter what they're going through in their lives, we accept them because we want to see what God wants to do in our lives, not just in the lives of others. We don't want to separate the church out. We want to be a part of something rich. And this is the promise that as we unify together, not only do we experience a more truer reality of the kingdom of God in our hearts and our minds and our lives, but we also begin to see the word of God spreading more and more. That means more and more people get to hear the good news of Jesus Christ as their Lord, their Savior, their King of their lives. And so we get to play a vibrant role in that. So here's my question to you. What groups are you struggling with? What people groups, what situations, what things in this world? Now, I'm not saying you have to agree with them all. But what are ways in which we can work together so that we don't end up splitting up the church? Now, that's a deeper issue. 
not just for you and for I, but for our whole country right now, even for the church. You may not know this, but the Methodist Church right now is getting ready to decide on whether it's going to stay together or split over the issue of human sexuality. And I feel like that's a shame because this part of Acts is telling us that our job is to work together in unity, to take care of each other, to love each other and provide for each other so that the church is a full representation of the kingdom of God. Now, that doesn't mean that it's easy. In fact, it's very hard. We've all been taught certain things. We've all experienced certain things. We've all come to know certain things that sometimes sit in opposition with one another. But there's a God who's bigger than all of that. A God who took on flesh, came to this earth, and provided a way for you and I to be reconciled to God the Father by giving himself a perfect sacrifice without blemish, without sin. And therefore, you and I now have a resurrected Lord and Savior in the person of Jesus Christ who stands between you and I and God the Father as the ultimate Redeemer. So that when God looks at you and me, he doesn't see our differences. He doesn't see our inadequacies. He doesn't see where we've fallen short. What he sees are his children. My prayer is that our church, the church, will be just like the kingdom of God, full of diverse people who are full of Christ's love and grace for one another. May it be so in our lives. My friends, let's celebrate this unique understanding that you and I are a part of the kingdom of God. We do so by taking communion, something that Christians have done for thousands of years. But it's an experience in which we understand and imitate what Christ did for us. And so I'm going to start with this cookie I brought, and I've got my water here. I would ask you to go get your elements for this next experience. And as you do, let us pray, and let's begin our time together in communion. Lord Jesus, take these elements. Make them true and whole. Make them everything we need right now to experience the living Christ in our lives. Allow this to be more than just an opportunity, but let it to be a situation in which we can commune with the holy God and with one another. Come now into this experience that we might be made whole through it. In Jesus' name, amen. But Jesus uses this metaphor as he takes the bread during the Passover meal uh, before he goes to the cross to give his life for all. And he takes the bread and he breaks it and he gives thanks to God for the wheat of the field. And just like the wheat had to be cracked and broken open in order to expose the seeds that would then be crushed into flour and baked into bread. That metaphor becomes a metaphor for his life. That from the beginning, God had always created this seed inside of Israel that one day a savior would come. As Christ wraps himself in flesh and leaves heaven to come to earth. He then takes on this amazing form of a wheat seed. The idea that he would be crushed and broken open so that he could be made into something more nourishing for humanity. And so here he comes, this ultimate sacrifice. So when we take and eat, we're reminded of the nourishment that Christ has given us through his death and resurrection that you and I are now made whole, brothers and sisters in the kingdom of God. Take and eat. Now, in the same way, Jesus would take the cup, but it's not just any cup. It's the fourth cup of the Passover meal in which he takes it and he gives thanks to God. And he reminds them that this wine or this juice is made from grapes that are crushed. And the idea, again, is that seed grows into a plant that then makes a marvelous fruit that then has to be crushed and then made into a drink. In the same way, his life would become that same metaphor. This beautiful seed that is brought to us through all the prophets that constantly remind us that God's promise will remain true. That he will fulfill everything he said he would. And so in the coming of Christ, which is dictated all through the entire Test Old Testament, we come to the realization that that Jesus of Nazareth is in fact the risen Christ. And so as we drink this, in my case, water, whatever you have, we're reminded of that promise that his body was broken for us, his blood was poured out for us, 
so that he becomes the ultimate sacrifice. No longer will we ever have to find another sacrifice for his reign supreme. And every time we stand before God, God remembers that sacrifice. Nothing can take that away from you and I. So take and drink, my friends, into the kingdom of Christ. Now, chapter 7 picks up where we meet Stephen and we see the ministry that he has in store for us in the book of Acts. And what happens to his life is he becomes the first martyr. Now, we're going to get into more of that this coming week on Monday and Wednesday, so I hope you'll join us online for that. In the meantime, my friends, be reminded of the love of Christ. Don't forget that next Sunday... Uh, the 19th is when we will all be together at Geller Park at 945. That's an hour earlier than normal so that we can beat the heat. Uh, we have recognized um, that the park is available. We have rented it. They have opened the restrooms for us and we plan to commune together. There will be more information on the website to follow. I do encourage you to bring your masks, uh, to bring your own lawn chairs, and if there's food or beverage you would like to have just for yourself or your family, you're welcome to bring that. But my friends, I look forward to seeing you. Uh, it's been a long time. God bless you in the name of Christ, and we look forward to our time together.